This is going to be about streams, caves, and the prairie home. We went on another little excursion, this time into southern Indiana, to a state park about three or four hours distant, depending on how many times we got lost. This was another wonderful state park. They are more modest than their federal sisters, not so grand, but well worth investigating. The rangers in this park were very friendly and proud of their domain, and they all had DNR on their caps, for Department of Natural Resources, of course, but whenever I saw one of them, all I could think of was, do not resuscitate. There were a lot of old folks staying at the inn, and someone recently told us that every cruise ship has a morgue, and someone he knew had been on a cruise where 16 people had died. When I expressed surprise at that number, he said, a lot of old people go on cruises. Maybe so, but no ship's morgue could hold 16 corpses. They must have been burying them at sea. <coughs> we were lucky. Once again, we had <coughs> great weather. Bright blue skies, breezy, on the edge of cool and warm, depending on where were you in shade or in the open sunlight. We were especially fortunate because the days before we arrived, they'd had a big storm, huge, with lightning and thunder and rain, a real gully washer, trees down, power out, lots of flooding. We missed all of that. We did, however, catch the runoff. Indiana, with all its limestone, is riddled with caves. There were several caves in the park, but we were informed that we could not go exploring because there was too much water, and we felt lucky for that again. We loved the powerful rush of the streams right at the top of their banks, and we'd been in enough caves lately. At one spot, called Twin Caves, the water came pouring out of a cave, snaked across the land until it came to another rock formation, into which it sank, diving into it, a howling torrent. It was thrilling to imagine jumping into the water and being flung toward the rocks and crashing down, down into the cave, and that's when tremendous fear, backed by common sense, kept me from jumping into the raging stream. But what a ride that would be! It was an awesome sight and sound, wild natural forces. They had a pioneer village in the park, and I wasn't too excited about that. I'd seen the like, I thought, but I hadn't. This was real, and it was extensive. They had a weaver in her own home, a blacksmith, absent for us, in his shop, a potter on the wheel in her small home, a schoolhouse, a meeting house, a large, very well-tended and colorful garden, and a grist mill, the feature on the property, all surrounded by trees, lush forest, and fed by rushing streams. The mill used one of the streams to power its wheel, carrying water in an aqueduct, starting in the stream, then stepping up to the height of the wheel, 20 feet. The water splashed into buckets, 60 pounds in each, emptying out at the bottom, so the wheel really kicked into gear when the miller pulled the bar. And there were many gears in the mill, transferring all that power to the millstone, whirling around, crushing corn to a fine, hot powder. The mill was built in 1820 by the same man who designed the mill at Mount Vernon, and when it was first operating, it was the most advanced, large-scale piece of technology operating in Indiana, a real dynamo. There were two houses in the village, one a fine place with everything needful, the other a two-story mansion, maybe not a Mount Vernon, but filled with the finest furniture and two massive fireplaces built out of that fine Indiana limestone. I sat and looked at the houses, made of such huge timber, uh, giving each structure a strong horizontal sweep. 
I realized that if the roof were flattened, you'd have the right house, the prairie home, like the one we'd recently seen, like the one he grew up in. Even the tall chimneys contributed to the horizontal touch built of narrow limestone blocks. So the look was there, wanting only to be slightly modernized using new building material. And I felt bad for criticizing Wright for the darkness in his home. It was a darkness he wanted, a darkness he grew up in, a darkness inside that he loved, that was a comfort to him. It was not the threatening darkness of the forest, it was a domestic darkness that could be cheerfully leavened by lamps. The village had an enormous parking lot. I mentioned it to a ranger and he said we could fill it five times over when we run the candlelight tours. Oh, sure. I thought of the candles, the hurricane lamps, and the great fireplaces, each with its own glow, and I realized that Wright had built exactly the kind of home he wanted, the prairie home. Not the modern home of the spoiled brat with all his electrical switches. Times change, and so do ways of living and design. My apologies, Frank.